in your house. They are ever praising you. Selah. If you have any prayer requests, fill out the slip that's in the bulletin, pass it in during the offering, and we'll pray for you today and throughout the week as well. Notice that the, uh, with the exception of the summer break for the adult Sunday morning Bible class, everything else is back in action with the IHOP Bible study on Monday at 7.30, Wednesday Tuesday study here in the sanctuary at 7.30, and the Manshed Bible studies Wednesday and Friday at 6 a.m. Change in the uh, food, uh, food ministry, uh, the Wichita ICT got sold, as I understand it, and the new owner is not participating as they, as they were. So Tom found that the Wichita Animal Action League has a program distributing food to the needy, so they're part, we're partnering with them now. Also partnering with the Treehouse Ministries with extra change for the needs of mothers and their babies. Next Thursday, July 13th, Thursday. I'm thinking that should be Saturday. Saturday. Yeah, I didn't catch that. Saturday, the 13th, uh, the Harvest Community Church presenting a blood drive here at, the, here at the church. That'll be from 9 a.m. to 3.30. If you'd like to participate and uh, need to set up an appointment or uh, text to the numbers on the screen, uh, if you can't write that down right now, check with us later and we'll, we'll get that for you. Psalm 121 verse 1 says, I will lift up my eyes to the mountains from where shall my help come? Standing on the Promises was written in 1886 by R. Kelso Carter. Mr. Carter based this hymn on 2 Peter 1, 3, and 4. Speaking of our Lord Jesus, Peter wrote, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises. Carter reminds us that Christ's promises cannot fail, and that when we stand on those promises, we also cannot fail. As you're able, please rise and join us as we open our worship with Standing on the Promises. That's one hymn you can't sing sitting down. Standing on the, the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of Christ my Savior. Standing, standing. Ah. Standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing. Standing on the promises of Christ my Savior, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of Christ my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Now, you may be seated. The gift of God's presence among us in Jesus Christ is freely given. We have only to open our hearts to accept it. Yet we are so accustomed to depending on our own meager resources 
that our faith is small and stingy, and often we only succeed in prying our hearts open just a crack. In full confidence that God will lift our sin from us if we confess it and ask God's help in turning from it, let us now unburden ourselves by confessing our sin before God. Lord, as we have heard your word challenge us to live sanctified lives, we admit to our deficiencies. Forgive us for the times we should have forgiven others, and instead we stewed and let our sentiment rob us. We confess we could have reached out to others to make peace, but instead we didn't want to be bothered with the negativity. We admit our hearts have not always pursued you and your righteousness this week. All these we come to you under the shed blood of Jesus. Amen. Our assurance of forgiveness comes from Isaiah 43. I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Guidelines for Living from Matthew 22. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Once again, as you're able, please rise and join us as we continue our worship.
my shepherd I'll not want is obviously the 23rd Psalm set to music and then it's been reworded to fit the tune. That tune is from a Scottish Psalter written in 18, or excuse me, 1650 by William Whittingham and others. The melody was written by Jesse S. Irvine in 1871 and arranged by David Grant in 1872. Father in heaven, we just want to thank you so much for this beautiful hymn coming off of the scriptures, Lord, and how easy it is for us in our life to realize, Lord, how much we do have and that you satisfy us, but sometimes we need to stop and think and thank. I praise you, Lord, for these folks today who are thankful as they put the money into the basket, Lord, and they give honor to you because of your many blessings you've poured upon us both in salvation for eternal life, but also a great life here. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. In your name we pray. Amen. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me Thank you all for your prayers. Um, when I had my body scan, uh, everything came out negative. I have no cancer, and we could rejoice to God about that. And also, you know, you, we pray about safety and stuff, but my wife was in an accident uh, this week, and she was part of a sandwich, and she was the middle section. And thank God she's okay, do, and we're grateful for that. And thankful, too, for the good scan and also the, this piece that was moved from my head. They didn't get any brain, which we're grateful for. But anyway, so let's come to the Lord and, and give thanks. Father in heaven, I just give you thanks so much for the wonderful blessings that you do give us. And I thank you, Lord, for this congregation and your faithfulness, for their prayers, for their love. 
We want to thank you especially, Lord. Um, I want to thank you personally for my body scan, that there was no cancer in my body or in my bone at least. I pray, Father God, you'll continue to also uh, thank you for your safety over Sandy and for all of us as we drive in this town and around, Lord, and how easy it is to get into an accident or get hurt. I want to pray also, too, Father God, for those that we know that are shut in. We think of our sister Lucille and for Joyce as she's still recovering from her surgery. I want to pray also, too, Father God, for our country as we're moving down this treacherous path of another election and a leadership board. And I just pray, Father God, that you'll guide and lead and direct the people of this nation to choose a leader who will be good for us and that, Lord, that um, you will honor you, Father. I pray also, too, for Steve's mom as she's in the hospital right now and she has some problems with her pacemaker, but she also has infections. Pray for her healing. We pray for Doug um, uh, Isley, who um, has some problems right now with a clot in his body, and we just pray for his healing. I pray for a friend, Mark, uh, who had surgery on his prostate. Bring healing to him. I pray also, too, for Jackie as she continues to heal from her hip surgery, and for Linda for her knee and also her carpal tunnel syndrome. I pray also, too, Father God, for... Uh, students who are home from school this year and or the summer, just keep them safe. I'm so saddened by some of the drownings and things that happen with children this summer at our city, in our community, Lord. We just pray for those who are broken. I pray for a friend whose son took his life. And I just pray, Lord, you'll bring healing to him and his wife and his other child, Lord, as they grieve the loss of this young man who had so much potential I pray also, too, for Brad and Sega as they have some issues. Lord, just bring healing to their minds and their hearts and strengthen them. I pray for Emmy, and I also pray, Father God, um, <clears throat> um, for um, Scott, Riff, uh, Scott um, Fulbright's family and his death. Lord, continue to be with them and the sadness that they experience, but also the joy in Christ. I pray also for Mr. Mack. And I pray also, too, for Tim, one of our teachers at school that is having problems with his liver. Father God, we, too, bring to you those who we know that are struggling with cancer. We think of Floyd Road Armor. We think of Everett. We think of uh, Samantha and Jason Stephen. And also for Jordan Ruckels. I pray also, too, for Sergeant Ryan from the west side here that has... Uh, daughter has to have brain surgery. We just pray for her healing too. And Lord, for others that we have right now on our mind that need our prayers, Lord, hear our prayers as we give them in our hearts to you. Now, Father God, use your word today to refine us, to strengthen us, to build us up as Christians, to walk in the faith, and to stand strong amongst the powers of evil in our nation, in our world, for our sinful natures that need to be harnessed and brought under the lordship of Christ, and for the, also, Father God, for the devil who puts his attacks on us with his demons, Lord. I just pray that you'll give us the strength and power by the Holy Spirit and that we will continue to appropriate him to our lives so that we can stand strong for you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Some of you heard of this phrase, to err is human, but there's a new second part of that. To err is human, but to cover up is also. Because a lot of times we cover up, don't we? The Bible speaks very, very strongly today about us. If you remember two weeks ago, we talked about David and his sinful failure of adultery and also murder. Winston Churchill one time was at a gathering and he was next to a stranger and he saw these two women coming at him. And he said to the fellow, boy, that woman's ugly. He said, well, you're talking about my wife. He said, no, the one next to her. He said, well, that's my daughter. He said, could you help me find my glasses? I can't see very well without them. He was great in covering up. He was fast on his feet. 
But how many times have you seen it in any of your own life? That we make excuses and we say all kinds of things to cover up rather than to honestly deal with our sin and really approach it. I love the Bible because the Bible is very honest to us about who we are. It does not cover up David. In fact, it exposes David who's a man after God's own heart. No one else was ever said about this in the Bible. But yet, we know the power of sin that God of hold of David. You see, even since the beginning of time, covering up for sin and not dealing with it properly has always been. Our parents, Adam and Eve, do you remember those two? Adam and Eve were in the garden, and God said, don't take of that tree, of course. What happened? They did it. And then we see what happens. They cover up. Here we see God is in the garden, walking in the garden in the cool of the morning. And Adam and his wife hid themselves. They never had any loss of intimacy with God until they partook of the fruit. Then all of a sudden, to hide, the covering, to trying to cover up what they had done. And God knew it. And so we see what happens. And they say they're naked. They're covering themselves. They never were afraid to be naked. But now, their sin caused them to be naked. They saw something they never saw before. And of course, the man is held accountable because he's the head of the home. And what does God say? He says, what happened here, Adam? What does Adam say? Verse 12. And the man said, the woman, <laughs> the woman whom you gave me, gave to be with me, gave me from the tree and I ate. Now what's he doing? He's... Tefloning from his own guilt and handing it over and blaming his wife. And what does Eve do? <laughs> God comes to her and the Lord said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, Why, the serpent deceived me and I ate. See what's happening? Everybody's passing it down. Well, today we're talking about David who covered up his sin for quite a while. You know, for a man who was close to God, it amazes me how long this lasted. Here David had four wives, beautiful wives, and yet he sees this beautiful woman taking a bath from his tower at the palace, and he has to have her. And it's Uriah, one of his faithful servants, who's out in the battlefield fighting for him. He has to have her. And we see that they finally, he calls her, and this is an active will decision, calling her over to him to his house. And they sleep together. She goes back, and she was not pregnant up until this time, and sends word to David that she's pregnant. Now, all this is a reminder of what happened when we talked about two weeks ago. And we know that many times we have seen this in public square of the government, of men and women in religion who walk with God, and people who are educated, who find themselves in these situations. And what does David do as a man of God? Well, you see, at that very moment, God was very far away from David. And he tries to cover it up. First, he tries to cover it up by bringing Uriah, who's out in the middle of the battlefield, and brings him home. Wants him to get some rest. Ha, ha, ha. He wants him to go be with his wife. Why? So that if he sleeps with her that night... That he doesn't have to worry about the baby because it was conceived by Uriah and Bathsheba and he's off the hook. But you know what? Uriah is more faithful to God and to David than David was to him. 
And he would not go and sleep with his wife, but rather slept outside the door because he didn't want to do that while his men were out in the battlefield and the Ark of the Covenant was out in the battlefield and he had too much integrity to do that while they're out there doing the battle. And David should have been out to the battle too, but he was not. Instead, he was bored. And there was this opportunity with Bathsheba. David finds out he doesn't sleep with her, and oh boy, he's got a second chance to try to cover it up. What does he do? He gets him drunk at a party, thinking he'll drop his values and morals, and he'll go home and go sleep with her. I'm done. But guess what happens? Even drunk, Uriah is more moral, more upstanding than David is sober. He doesn't sleep with her. He sleeps at the city gate to protect it because of his men and the Ark of the Covenant out on the battlefield. So David's really frustrated now. How do we cover this up? David devises the plan. He writes a note to General Joab, who's out on the field still battling, and says to him, put Uriah out in front. Get involved with the battle intensely and then at a signal have your troops draw withdrawal that he doesn't know so that he can get killed. And what David has done is set him up for murder. And you see, David gives him an envelope that's sealed with the king's seal to give to Joab that has the plan in the envelope. And Uriah is going to hand that envelope, which is his own death sentence. This is how deceitful, deceitful we can be. No matter how godly we can, when we allow sin and our own desires and the world to grab a hold of us, and we can lose sight of God's wisdom and his strength. And here we have it plain and simple before us. The Bible says in Jeremiah... The heart is deceitful, above all things, desperately wicked, and who can know it? Folks, let me tell you something. If there's one thing you get out of the message today, never think you're above falling into sin. Some of the greatest guys I've known in the ministry, spiritual men, I've seen fall. My heart even be broken because I know how close they were to God. But they stumbled and that when we see a Christian leader fall, we should not be surprised. Satan will go after them. And then also their position in their heads and in their guts and in their, their own selfish sinfulness can easily get a hold of them and draw them into sin. And the Bible says, your sin will find you out. Numbers 23, 32, 23. It will come to light. I had a friend one time at the Y, and he was telling me that he was going through a tough time in his marriage. His wife had kicked him out. I said, why? He said, well, 10 years ago, I was working for FEMA. And while I was away working for FEMA, I met this young woman, and we had a thing. I had forgotten about it. It had been 10 years. And he said, all of a sudden, one day, she contacted my wife, and she kicked me out, changed the locks, called the lawyer. We've been married, he said, now for 30 years. This happened 10 years ago. We had been married for 20 years. He said, I don't know what to do. I said, you need to get to the Lord and pray and change your heart and admit what you've done and come clean. And then he made up a whole bunch of excuses. You know how it goes. Well, I was unhappy. She was with so much with the kids. Yada, yada, yada. No excuse, folks. We find ourselves sometimes locked in the power of sin. And we can easily fall short. 
We need God's help in seeing what we've done and admitting to it. And it's amazing to me with David who had a heart, such a heart for God, did not really come clean about his sin for almost a year. She got knocked up and David didn't do anything except plot this out and take care of business. And oh, and then he looked like the hero because her husband gets killed on the battlefield and he takes her in and marries her so she can have, because he was such a military hero. And he looked so good when he had done such a terrible thing and revolted God. And yet it took almost a year for him to come clean, nine months, about his sin. And the Bible tells us what he felt during that time. In Psalm 32, it said, Blessed is the man whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent... My bones grew old though my, through my groaning all the day long and day and night, for your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into drought of the summer. He's saying, I was famished because I was without you. And I, I wasn't coming clean and, and, and I felt your hand upon me, but it was working so well. The cover up. But I was dying inside. You see, that's what happens. People die inside. They become calloused in their hearts when they allow this to go on. And this is what happened with him. And all of a sudden, you're trying to keep it up. My friend who was with FEMA, he was trying to keep it up for years. Thought he was in the clear. Kind of like Lucille and Ethel when they're trying to keep the wrappers on the candy and they can't and they're showing them in their mouth and putting them in their shirt and in their hair because they can't keep up. He couldn't keep up. His wife finally found out. You see, that's why we need good Christian men and women who come by our side. Not only our spouses, but we need each other so that we can see who we really are. You see, that's what the body of Christ is all about. This is called the Jahari window. And basically it shows us what happens. We know things about ourselves and so do people around us. But notice on the top, on the right hand side, it says that we're blind to. And over here that we're, we hide that we only know and people don't know. And God has given us each other and the body of Christ and spouses to help us move this so we can get more and more open about our blindnesses because what happens is we don't see it. We need somebody to, because we're blind to it. David was blind to his sin here. He didn't want to see it. And he needed somebody to come along and say, David. And that happens. God loved David and he chastened him. He cared so much about him that he didn't want him to continue to live the lie. So he comes to David. God uses a man by the prophet by the name of Nathan. To help him come clean. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. And the rich man had great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he brought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and his children. It would eat of the bread and drink of his cup. And lie in his own flock, in his own herd. 
to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. And rather he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Nathan paints this picture of this wealthy guy who's got all kinds of sheep and cattle and a poor guy who only has one. So close to that little ewe lamb that it even sleeps with the family. And the rich guy comes and takes that lamb and uses it to to feed his wayfaring friend. And David goes ballistic. David goes out of control. Little does David know that he's been set up. You know, Gary Smalley speaks about this kind of communication in his book, about communicating to some of those hard issues that people don't want to face. And the way to do it is to paint the picture in somebody else's life. And it's easy to see it in somebody else's life, but not easy to see it in our own. And Nathan does that. He paints this picture of this lamb situation. And David sees the injustice And he reacts. He goes off the deep end. Look what he says. And David's anger burned greatly against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. He must make restitution for the lamb fourfold. Because he did this thing and had no compassion. And Nathan then said to God, You are the man. Thus says the Lord of Israel, It is I who anointed you king over Israel, and it is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. I also gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your care. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had not been too little, I would have added to you many more things like these. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and you have taken his wife to be your wife, and you have killed him with the sword of the sons of Amnon. Wow. David is caught in his tracks, stunned by Nathan. And he's opened up to show the things that he has done. How sinful he was, and it's exposed now. Nathan found the way to get to him. God gave him that way to communicate it through this beautiful little story. In fact, there are nuances in the Hebrew of this text that talk about a little lamb, a daughter. That, And isn't it funny how the word Beth, which means little daughter, part of Beth, she was named. And about the fourfold lambs. And the fourfold being told how he should fix this situation. That's what David comes up with. You see, the word in the Hebrew, when Nathan says, you are the man, it's really you the man. We hear that in our contemporary culture, you the man. Well, he was the man who did this. And what we see here is David had committed six and broken six of the commandments that God had given. Here's to be this man of God. But guess what? He forgot it all because his sin had a hold of him. His desire had a hold of him. The world had a hold of him. And he missed it. He committed the first commandment by breaking it. Because he disrespected the Lord who had given him all the stuff. And that he put his desire above God's will. And Nathan just nails him with what God said to him. David, he anointed you as king. David, he delivered you from the hands of Saul several times. David... He gave you all his master's family, houses, wives, concubines. 
He made you the king over not only Judah, but all of Israel. He would have added even more to your life. And ask the question, why did you despise the Lord? You see, he broke the tenth commandment by coveting her. He broke the eighth commandment by stealing her. He broke the seventh commandment by committing adultery with her. He broke the ninth commandment because he bore witness against Uriah, lied to him, and then murdered him. The sixth commandment. It is tragic when people who are confronted with this don't really see it. I know a situation where a woman was tired of her marriage and her husband, she claimed, was abusive to her. When it was found out, he was not. But she was tired of the marriage and she didn't want to have to go through a divorce. So she contacted somebody that she thought could eliminate her husband from the earth. <laughs> a hitman. And they had her on tape. And when they arrested her for trying to get someone to kill her husband, she would say, she was saying to the detectives, no, you've got it all wrong. I was doing that because I was trying to do my own investigation. Really? You see how easily sin can pollute our minds? Hear this great man of God, David. Does all those commandments break him? David is caught red-handed. No more covering it up. No more excuses. Time for him to come clean. And when a person finally comes clean and is honest with themselves about what they have done, that begins the process of restoration to their lives. When they repent and say, I want to change and I want to be different, that's when true restoration can come. We see it here. In verses 10 through 13. Now therefore the Lord, the sword, shall never depart from your house. Because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. And thus says the Lord, behold, I will rise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companions and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did in secretly, but I do this thing before all of Israel and under the sun. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. He finally confesses. He finally comes clean. We see it in his psalm. If you want to read an interesting, beautiful psalm. Psalm 51. Where he claims and he calls out to God to have mercy on him. Because he finally comes to grip with his sin. Have mercy on me. According to your unfailing love. I don't deserve it, God. Please, God. Have mercy on me. Transform me from my wickedness. Don't hide yourself from my sins. Blot them out. Don't remove your spirit from me. But restore me to the joy. He is pleading to God. Because he realizes finally what he's done. When we have unconfessed sin, folks, you don't realize it's blocking you from the joy of your Lord. It's blocking you from allowing His Spirit to overflow in you. And it doesn't have to be an adulterous situation. It can be many things. Whether it be a gossip situation, or an anger that you have, or whatever sin 
And we all have our pet sins, folks, believe me. That can hold you and keep you from experiencing the joy. And folks, the tragedy about sin, and this story beautifully presents it to us, that we can have forgiveness for the sin in our life. Christ washes that away. But sometimes with our sin, we create consequences that once that ball gets rolling, it continues to pick up momentum and cause destruction. You see, like we were saying last week about Steve Ferrara's quote, where he says, sin will take you beyond where you don't want to go. It will hold you in places you never thought you would be. And that thirdly, it will take you costly, very much will cost you much. And that's what happened with David. If you remember what David said about the fellow who took those little lamb from that family? He said he needs to make restitution at least four times as many. And David pays the price for his sin. His hidden heart of sexuality that he never really got in control of until now. Because we know the Bible tells us what happens. And that is that his son is going to die that's born from her. However you became this dread... This by deed, you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also is born, will surely die. So number one, the baby that she is going to give birth to is going to die. Number two, his second son from another wife, Amnon, sees his stepsister... And he falls in love with Tamar and pulls her into bed and rapes her. And guess what happens? Her full brother, Absalom, gets upset. And devises a plan for over two years to kill him and finally kills Amnon. So that's the second son he's lost. And also a daughter that's raped. Then thirdly, Absalom who doesn't believe in his father anymore and doesn't trust him and rebels against him and tries to overrun his kingdom and winds up getting killed by General Joab. And then the fourth one is Adonijah, who tries to take over David's kingdom from him also and winds up dead. You see, this is the ripple effect that sin does to our lives. That's why we're so ardent to keep ourselves strong in the Lord and not to fall. Because we know how painful it can be. Katy, Texas. High school football team at Texas Stadium. National championship of the state for its division. Everybody was so excited And just as they were about ready to go off the bus, an official from the group that ran it told the players to get back on the bus and go home. Because one of their players had forged his name on a certificate so that he could play the game. And it was a forgery of a teacher's certificate. And they had to forfeit the game. After winning the previous game, 40 to nothing. But you see how it can affect. The ripple effect it can have. The Bible speaks here to us. And what a wonderful thing God is gracious to us. Even though we don't deserve it. Because later on in Matthew chapter 2. Who comes to be part 
of the genealogy of Jesus, Solomon. Their second son, Bathsheba and David. But it's interesting that Matthew shows us that no matter where we've been, God's grace can use us for his glory. Because in Matthew's gospel, it doesn't say David, the father of Solomon, whose mother was David's wife. Instead, it says David, the father of Solomon, whose mother was Uriah's wife. God still shows his grace and gives us victory when we finally complain about our sins and that he washes us clean and gives us new life. Conviction needs to take place. We need to come clean with God for this then to pick up our momentum so that we repent and change our ways. Not do the sins that we commit. Repentance comes. King Saul, he repented, but it wasn't true repentance. David so was. And that we have to be careful. You know, as we look at, I, I never forgot how bad I felt when I heard about Ravi Zacharias, a tremendous Christian speaker. I heard him when he first started out in New York City when I was a young pastor. And I thought, man, this guy's got it going on. And he wrote several wonderful books, an apologetic about the Christian faith. And here we find out that he dies, the sins that he had committed and his sex addiction. And the Bible here tells us, folks, never think you're above falling. I tell young people who are going into the ministry, make sure you put boundaries around your life and your ministry because you don't know what that other person's agenda is. You don't even know in your own heart. You may be having a bad day and a weak day and you may give yourself in and make sure you don't put yourself into situations like that. Because you can easily fall. In a weak moment. None of us is above failure. And when we see these things happen to others, Christians, other leaders, we should pray for them. That they come to the repentance and change their ways. And not say, well, there's another Christian who fell. No. That brother or sister needs our prayer. Because it's destroying a marriage, destroying a man of God's witness to the community or a woman of God's. And David surely showed that to the world. But you see, this is where God's forgiveness comes. Nathan went to his house and the Lord struck the child. Uriah's wife bore the David so that he was very sick. And David therefore inquired of the Lord God of, for the child. And David fasted and went and lay all night on the ground. David wanted that child to live, but God said no. He was one of basically the brokenness of what this whole situation is. And David needed to come to grips, which he did. And God forgave him. He put away then his sin. God took it away from him. You know, there's nothing worse than we can be hypocritical. I was reading about Max Licato. He comes from a family of alcoholics. Some of you have read his books, tremendous Christian writer. But one of the things he began to find that in his 20s, he really enjoyed that cold, frosty mug of beer and getting drunk. But it wasn't until he went to a rehab center to see his sister that God turned the light on his heart to change. 
He saw the damage that it did to his beautiful sister. And he said, at 21, I swore off I'd never drink again. Well, Ten years passed. Got married and had some kids. But then the craving came back. And he started drinking again. But one day, he came to the realization as he was sitting in the parking lot of a liquor store drinking out of the bag that he was being a hypocrite. Something that he spoke about tremendous amount of times and wrote about in his materials. And he said, I realized what a lie I had been living to my daughters who thought I was a great Christian man, but I was hiding the beer when I knew it was wrong for me, not for other people, but I knew it was wrong for me. And here I was talking against it, but here I was taking it. And he said, I that day put that beer in the garbage can and have been sober since. See, that's when we can really turn the page and say no. You see, sometimes it's hard for us to come to grips with that. We live in denial. It's a big river. And many of us live in it. And we deny who we are and what we're doing. And sometimes we've been hurt also by the sin, someone else hurting us. And we can't hide from it. We have to do the work of forgiveness in our own hearts. Because without that, we'll get bitter. The Bible talks about a bitter, a root of bitterness that can easily settle into our hearts if we don't forgive. And what we need to do is once we're shocked by what has happened. Some of you knew when you sat here in the room back in October last year. And I got ripped apart by my own denomination. I've had to do some work about that forgiveness to the fellow who'd made that and say, God, I love him. I ask you to help me forgive him. And I need to forgive him. Because otherwise what happens is you see, and you got to understand, be aware of your feelings. Sometimes we say we've forgiven him, but it's really we just put it out of our mind. We have to forgive him. We need to come to grips with our feelings after we've been hurt and deal with the anger that we have because of it and realize that it's hurtful. Maybe that person has hurt us, but we don't want that bit of rootedness, that, that bitterness, that root of bitterness to enter into our hearts because we want to be free to love Jesus who made us to be free to enjoy life. And we've got to get rid of that bitterness. Let it go. Speak about it. Talk to the Lord about it. Get a friend who can listen. And sometimes we also have a hard time admitting that what we've done we can't believe we're such sinners. <laughs> and we are. You committed a sin, admit it. Go to the Lord for forgiveness. If you've offended somebody, go to them. That's what the Bible's way is. Because you don't want anything to block you from the joy of the Lord and the joy of that relationship. Some people like to bargain. Like Adam and Eve. Well, the reason why I did it was because of them. Well, it was my wife who made me do that. Your wife can't make you do anything. Or well, it's that boss that made me, no, 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 no. Admit to what you have done. Sometimes we can even get depressed over it. Because we're angry. We're angry at ourselves that we did that. Or we're blaming somebody else that we did that. 
And our anger turns inward inside and we get depressed. God doesn't want you to be depressed. He wants you to be free to love him. And to enjoy him. And let it go. If you're holding a grudge, the only one that's holding the grudge is you. You're holding, being held by your grudge. Let it go. Give it over to the Lord. Otherwise, it's going to depress you. And then accept God's grace. That not only has he been gracious to the person who's hurt you. But even more so, the grace of Jesus Christ that's for you. That's forgiven you for all your sins. And given you eternal life. And has forgiven you for every failure in your life that you've committed. And if you're fearful, address those fears. Go to God and say, Lord, I'm worried about if I get thrown into another situation. And he'll help you build that. I have told you in some of the situations I've been thrown into, it's, I know, because I've built barriers around me, there's some places you just can't go. Because it's dangerous. People can even say things about you that are not true. So you build the wall. And you address your fears. And stand firm in your faith. And realize that God will protect you. And give you victory. And give you the strength. I know a little girl that. In this city here that used to be a prostitute. She used to work lower Broadway. And oh boy. She came to know Christ. But you know, there were a lot of people who didn't want her, let her go. Wanted to keep her in her own family. And that this Jesus stuff was baloney. But she continued to cling to the grace of Jesus Christ. She teaches Sunday school. Has gotten married. Has children of her own now. And is filled with Christ's love. There are people who may not want you to win that game. But you win it. Because Christ is in you. And his power will give you the ability to conquer you don't have to fear anything with the Lord as your strength. No matter what you've done in the past, it is gone. It's forgiven. In the book of Hebrews, it says that, that we say to God, God, remember that sin after we've confessed it. And he says, what sin? Because he's wiped it from his memory. You need to wipe it from your memory. So that you can be free. So that the person that you love can be free and gain the victory. And that's why today we close with this passage from Psalm 32. David just had written again about this whole situation. Psalm 32. Read it today. Beautiful. But he says here, And my iniquity I have not hid. He came clean. And I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. He went to the Lord for his strength, for forgiveness. The shed blood of Christ. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. No more holding us, but victory. Let's pray together. Lord, today we're going to come to you in this communion feast. And what a tremendous reminder of the forgiveness that we have in you. That we have been forgiven for all of our sins. That we've been given eternal life because of what Jesus did. And we trust that. And that, Lord, we thank you that when we fall and we sin and we commit sin, that you're there to forgive us. And to give us the strength to repent and change our ways and be new. Father, as we come to your table, help us all to feel that freedom. And the joy of knowing you as our Savior and Lord. Amen.
Beloved in the Lord, the Holy Supper which we're about to receive is a remembrance, it's a communion, and it's of a hope. We come into remembrance that the Lord Jesus Christ sent of the Father into the world to assume our flesh and blood and fulfill all obedience to the divine law, even the bitter and shameful death on the cross. And by his death, resurrection, and ascension, he has established a new and eternal covenant of grace and reconciliation that we might be accepted of God and never be forsaken by him. We come to have communion also with the same Christ who's promised to be with us always, even to the end of the world. And in the breaking of this bread, he makes himself known to us as the true heavenly bread that strengthens us in the eternal life. And in the cup of blessing, he comes to us with the vine and whom we are to abide if we bear fruit. And finally, we come in hope, <laughs> believing that this bread and this cup are a pledge of his foretaste of his feast of love, which we will partake when the kingdom finally comes. And with one unveiled face, we shall behold him made like unto him in his glory. Since by his death, resurrection, and ascension, he has obtained for us this life-giving spirit who unites us all in one body. So we are to receive the supper and true, loving, mindful communion with the saints. Lord Jesus, the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. He said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembrance of the body of Jesus Christ that has been broken for us. Amen. In like manner, Jesus took the cup, and when he had supped, he said, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it. In remembrance of me.
blood of the Lord Jesus Christ spilled for us. Holy and gracious God and Father, we thank you for the care and the love that you showed on the cross. That all our sins, past, present, and future, have been dealt with. And we can be free to enjoy and to live in your grace. Father God, I pray for this family today as they leave here. Help them to feel that freedom and that joy. And that, Lord, that they can spread it throughout the land and people can see their hearts worn by your love, Jesus. Help their families to understand them and see that love. God, thank you for today. In Jesus' name, amen. Please rise with me as we receive our benediction and we sing our closing song. And now go in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, your Father, and the power of the Holy Spirit being infested you so that you can be the person that God has called you to be wherever you go. Amen. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to thank Jesus. I learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend upon your word.